do a collab video with Alex Steele to fabricate one. You're talking about the Hammer of Truth video I did there a couple weeks ago on the Clark Technique EQ. Alex Steele is a guy who does metal forging. I think that'd be a really amazing idea. Does anyone know how to get hold of this guy? I would absolutely be thrilled to do a collab like that. How's it going? Welcome to SMG Viewers Comments, episode number 271. Wow, I can't believe I've been doing it this long. I'd just like to thank each and every single one of you guys for sticking with me through all of this, through thick and thin. It's been absolutely amazing. I can't believe I'm 271 episodes into this and you guys are still watching. That's absolutely fucking amazing. You guys keep the questions coming. I will keep answering them. That is the deal. And here we go right now. My dad has been an amp tech my entire life and I've been recording amps for about 10 years. In my opinion, heavily informed by his 40 plus years experience, changing tubes it makes zero difference to the sound. Honestly, zero. Wow, are you ever going to piss off a lot of guitar players and an awful lot of forums with that shh don't let it know the bag man seriously though I, unless you're changing tube types i really curious to know the the big differences from tube to tube sure you can get match sets and whatnot but how much is an audible difference that actually comes out of the speakers now i'm shooting this about 11 days before i drive home i'm gonna have some more information on that next week uh, so when i get back to specter what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna pull some different power tubes out of a few different amps i have and drop them into one test amp that self biases. And we're gonna see exactly what happens when you change power tubes out for different brands. And we're also gonna try that with preamp tubes as well. I've got enough amps kicking around and probably enough spare tubes kicking around to do that test more than once. Great thing about amps like a 5150 is they are self biasing. As long as you put six L6s in, you're probably pretty much gonna get it right. So of course the argument can be made about biasing, but that's a whole different thing. When you when you bias an amp differently, yes, that will change the sound if you make the tubes run hotter. There's no question about that. But with a modern self-biasing amp that pretty much everybody's using in their studios that's not using amp sims, I think that is a question and a test that needs to be run. And I will be more than happy to do it with null tests, of course. I've been thinking this one through, been putting putting my methodology together, and I think it's gonna be really cool. Who knows? The results may be shocking. Now, of course, if you want to see that test, make sure you hit the subscribe button. That way you get notified when that video drops. I'm sorry if this isn't the place, but I have a question about Reaper and I can't find any solution online. I'm mixing some songs for my band and I got a nice compressor and when I use reinsert to add the compressor to the track, I hear it fine on the modern, but when I render the project track I use insert, it doesn't come out in the mix. I really don't know what to do. Dude, I made that exact same mistake. No worries. I mean, this is, this is easy to overlook. What you want to do, you want to go into your render options and what you've got it set for right now is full speed offline. What you want to do is a real time online render. There's a little drop down option to click once again, real time rendering, and it will run your compressor in real time through your mix, no problem at all. Hopefully you found that helpful. Good luck, dude. Hope it works out. Classic rock drums are boring. John Bonham puts me to sleep. I get it. How, how you like that trash? Simple. I'd much rather hear John Bonham play his ass off, give it everything he's got, than hear somebody try and do, you know, 300 BPM double kicks and have to fix it with a computer because we all know that's super convincing. And really, 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 Really impressive. Hey man, have you been secretly taking guitar lessons from Warren? I see quite a bit of improvement on your guitar chops. Why, yes I have. You know, that's a great thing about hanging out with a world-class guitar player every single day. It kind of starts to rub off. I heard Warren make a couple comments about economy and moving your fingers up and down the fretboard. So I asked him to show me what the hell he meant by that. And he gave me a couple exercises to work on and it's been really helping improve my playing. I've been practicing every single night because after everybody goes home, I basically got 14 hours of solitary confinement. I'm up on a hill, I can't go anywhere. And anyway, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in the next episode, but it has led to a lot of guitar playing. You know, I'll just sit on the couch and, and run scales for hours on end while I watch a movie or something like that. So yeah, it's been a big help. He taught me two really cool things. Now I could probably do a little tutorial on that if you guys were interested and just show how it improved my playing. Now. I'm not saying I'm a qualified guitar teacher. No, not in the least. For that, I'd say check out Robert Baker's channel because he's an awesome dude and an awesome teacher. However, these runs did help me improve my playing massively, as a bunch of you guys noticed. And 
Thank you so much, by the way. I really do appreciate that. Hey, everybody, just going to break in here for a sec, let you guys know we've got something that you've been asking for for quite a while now, and that is a vocal production course. Chris Lipe has a double shot course called Empowering Your Voice and Vocal Recordings. It's absolutely amazing because he teaches you as a vocalist to push past your limits and deliver performances that you never thought you were capable of. Now, this works for singers as well as metal screamers, and it also works for vocal producers because he coaches you on how to get performances out of the vocalists. Now, this pair of courses usually goes for $400, but there's a very limited time offer for $167. It's only going to be around for a few days, uh, so grab it while you can. And for you guys who are super ambitious, there's a pro version where you will get a group call with Chris and he will track your progress once every three weeks for the next 12 weeks and that's going for 227. Now I'm going to take this course myself and I want to apply it to my own vocals because I would really like to sing on my own mic demos for a change and I used to sing in a band many many years ago kind of lost my voice I'm very curious to see what will happen. I'm also going to have Chris on a couple more episodes this week where we talk about how to prepare as a vocalist we also talk about some of our favorite metal singers so make sure you check that out as well. Anyway links are in the description below now back to the show. All right, it's everybody's favorite part of the episode, and uh, we finally found a butthurt Clark Technic owner. Dan Cornup uses those on his mix bus for every mix. I'll take an actual professional engineer's opinion over a YouTube clone. Fuck, I hate having to give this jackass a view and a comment. Well, hey, Blake, I'll tell you this. Dan is certainly entitled to his opinion, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's infallible either. I'd say it's great that he manages to get hit records despite putting the Clark Technic EQs on his mix. When I ran my test, it sounded like dog shit. What do you want me to do? Sit here and lie to you guys about it? It's a fucking terrible unit. Don't buy it. However, I get it. Half the reason you watch these videos is for purchase validation. Nobody wants to be told they made a bad purchase. However, the flip side of that is I can warn a lot of you guys that, hey, you know what? It might look like a Pultec. It doesn't sound anything like a Pultec and you're gonna get a way better deal if you get a plug-in because that's actually gonna sound far closer to the real thing. What can I say, Blake? Sorry you wasted your money, bro. It's a shit test if you mix it out on one machine to the point where it sounds good and then just copy the settings to the other machine. This only tells that the knobs don't do the same things on two different machines. Have you checked even two original Pultex cancel each other without the same settings? What it doesn't tell you is how close you can get to the original sound by tweaking the knobs a little. I really love how you ignore the fact that I dialed in the Waves Puig Tech plug-in EQ to the exact same settings of the Pultec and it sounded far closer to the Pultec than the Clark did. That was kind of the whole point. It's like you can dial the Clark in, it's not going to sound like a Pultec. And the thing is there's so few controls on that EQ, it doesn't matter if I crank it or not, it's still going to sound like shit. Do you understand? Are you paying attention? Don't fucking buy it. And if you did, Get rid of it! I love the Hammer of Truth videos. Well, like I said at the beginning of the video, I think it'd be amazing if we get a custom one made up. Now, about the Hammer of Truth, I haven't pulled that thing out in a couple of years because I think those type of videos should be special. For those of you guys nerdy enough to remember this cartoon, it's something I grew up with as a kid in the 70s. It was called Battle of the Planets, which was an Americanized version of the Japanese cartoon Science Ninja Team Gatchaman. I used to watch this every single day after school when I was about eight years old. And they had this thing, uh, they, they flew around in this ship called the Phoenix and every once in a while they get into some super desperate situation they have to go into this mode called the fiery phoenix where they'd light the ship on fire and it was really cool but they only did it maybe three or four times over the entire series and i thought that was really cool because they had the ultimate hail mary play and they never used it and i thought that the hammer of truth should be like the fiery phoenix i should only pull it up when absolutely necessary on ultimate pieces of shit garbage like the Clark Technique. That way viewers like Blake Matthews will actually understand that yes, it is a piece of shit. Shit is still shit when you gift it to a poor kid. You wouldn't gift wrap a turd and give it to someone just because they don't have a turd in here. Yeah, that's a great point. As we showed in the video, putting the Clark on a source makes it sound worse. Saving that EQ and giving it to a kid would be a dis 
service. That being said, I am giving away $35,000 of gear on the Oldies But Baddies competition. Make sure you tune in on Sundays for the review videos. Now, I've got a bunch of guest judges coming up. Next week, we're going to have a couple of episodes with Felicity, uh, the drummer I had on the show there earlier this year when we did that Clayman sound video. And I just shot a couple of episodes with Rudy Ayoub as well. You can look for him in maybe three or four weeks once I get everything edited and online. Having an awful lot of fun with us. I highly recommend watching it. And yeah, it's going to be my pleasure to give away some absolutely amazing gear to somebody who really, truly deserves it. Now, that's including my own personal Rev Generator 120 that I paid for it with my own money. See, now that is something I'm happy to give away. Not a complete piece of shit. Next up, we're going to take a look at a few questions from the Ask Glenn section of the SMG Discord. If you guys haven't joined it, please do. It's a really amazing online community to help you make better records. I've got links in the description below. And of course, the best thing is it's absolutely free. I'm in the Consulta Student Facebook group and people are posting that all DAWs do not sound the same. Each DAW has its own sonic characteristics similar to an amp's tone. I've transferred a session from Logic to Pro Tools and when playing back the raw tracks, the original tracks as recorded and no post-production mixing with EQ effects, compression, etc. added, I found no evidence that I have any unique sound that persuaded me to come loyal to a dot. Do you think that each DAWs have some unique sound that makes it radical different in the sound of the raw tracks? If you're talking about straight up raw tracks, no, a DAW's job is to play them back and not fuck with them. Now, that's not saying you're gonna get different results with each DAW's channel strips. I mean, Cubase has a certain way of doing it with their channel strips. Uh, same with Studio One. It's got a really cool channel strip as well, and you're definitely gonna get different results. The only DAW I can think of offhand that is designed from the ground up to have its own sound is Harrison Mix Bus. And that's designed to emulate a Harrison X32C console, which is absolutely fucking wicked. I've gotten some really great results. I did a shootout there a couple years ago called Mix Wars, where I shot Harrison out against Reaper, and we got some very different results, and a lot of you guys prefer the Harrison thing. Now, I have a license for the new version of Harrison, and when I get back to Windsor, I'm probably gonna pull it up and try shooting it out against a couple other DAWs as well, just to see what kind of results we can get. It's a wonderful system, and uh, if you're doing a lot of mix work, you can really, rip through some mixes very, very quickly. Like on an album project, it's got an amazing sound. You can't say enough good things about it. Hopefully they've got the real-time monitoring thing figured out now. That was the big thing holding me back from working with it full time. So looking forward to diving into that whenever I get back. Make sure you watch that video. Hey Glenn, I'm old and somehow ended up in a garage band. We moved to my garage. I live in suburbia hell and like my two bands. I'm already moving from a 50 watt to a JCM 800 studio, but our drummer uses an acoustic set, which sounds great, but there are so many hard surfaces. It's like the garage is a giant speaker. How do I not drive the neighbors nuts? I've used a dynamat and acoustic tiles in the past, but I don't know what the right stuff is. I can't really do ceiling tiles because of the hanging racks things do normally stash in the garage, but I'm not worried about the house noise anyway. Thanks in advance, love the show. I'm learning how to do it right this time. Well, you're talking about two different things. You're talking about internal acoustic treatment versus isolation. Now to get isolated, what you need to do is make your garage airtight. And a garage door usually isn't the best way to deal with that kind of stuff. You might want to put some kind of a temporary barrier in front of that garage door probably some kind of a two by four framing with some rock wool bats in it. That being said, I would definitely recommend putting up some cloth covered rock wool around your garage to absorb some of the reflections. They will make a gigantic difference in how that room sounds. As I always say this, when acoustic questions come up, check out the John Sayers Studio Design Forum. They helped me build Spectre Sound back in Windsor. I got some amazing results and there's just an amazing community there that can help you with your acoustic problems. Can't say enough good things about that place. Definitely worth Googling. In fact, my very good friend, Dave Velez, uh, who watches this show quite a bit, he just redid his garage with advice he got from that forum as well. And he's getting some amazing results. Hey Glenn, when it comes to compressing the snare drum, would you do anything different for a high tune snare compared to the medium to low tune snare? I don't know if it's really a tuning thing versus a drummer thing. Now, when I compress a snare drum, I just crank everything to maximum. I crank the ratio up, fast attack, medium release, and then I'll take the threshold down. What I'll do is I'll start to slow down the attack time till it starts letting the crack through. You hear that piff, piff, piff. And then I'll pull the threshold back and tune it that way. Try that, I think you might like the results you get. Have you ever used multiple amps specifically for how to handle the EQ bands? For instance, one amp being too boomy in the bass, so roll that down and add an amp just for the bass. I don't think I've gone that far. I mean, there's definitely something to be said for blending a 5150 and a valve state because they both occupy different parts of the spectrum. And of course, In Flames did that brilliantly on the Clayman record. And then they did a valve state and a Laney uh, 100 watt as well and got some amazing results there too. That might be something, maybe find an old solid state amp to blend with a tube amp. You might like the results you get. 
Hmm, now I'm thinking, I think I want to try maybe blending my Galleon Kruger with maybe one of my Synergy amps or something like that. That might be freaking cool. Galleon Kruger, ooh, what's that? Could that possibly be an episode when I get home? Hmm. Hey Glenn, newbie alert. With the pandemic going on, I've decided to get back into writing and sound chasing. I've started from the bottom, computer interface, etc., and still have a long way to go, but with amp sims and yes, drum sims, I'm able to at least write out what I intend to later play. I watched and really like the sounds you were able to get out of the PRS Archon plugin and found your mixing methods have put me in the direction I want to go. Thank you for that. Do you have any recommendations for bass amp plugins, free or not? Maybe shoot out like you did with the amp sim versus real amp. Thanks for reading this, and if you got this far, fuck you, Glenn. Yes! A lot of people have been complimenting me on the bass tone I've been getting on a lot of of demos I've been doing lately, and I've been going back to the Mammoth Bass plugin. Now, I did a review on it there a few months ago, and it only got like 13,000 views, and which is a real shame because I think a lot of you guys missed out. It's like 38 bucks, and it's I use it on every single one of my mixes because it just sounds absolutely ferocious. It's definitely one of the best bang for the buck plugins you're gonna find out there besides the Nobel's ODR1 plugin that comes with my free R's links in the description below for that. So I would definitely recommend checking it out. And if you haven't, please check out my Mammoth Bass video because it is definitely worth taking a look at. In several of your videos, you remarked about potential hazard when using multiple microphones on a single source phasing. Never understood what this was. Thought it might be referring to latency in the distance between the mics and the speed of sound of the source. Obviously, this is incorrect because you did that video featuring Tube Gadget versus the plugin version and flipped the phase on one of them, expecting them to cancel each other out. So what is phasing? How will I know when I'm experiencing it? How is it overcome when using mics to record a source like a drum kit? Dude, I've got just the video you're looking for. It's called Audio Basics Phasing. Hit the little card up here. It'll take you right to it. And this lays it all down for you in simple to understand language that even bass players can get and it shows you how the mics work together and can work against each other uh, depending on where they are placed on an instrument, like say a snare drum or one. If you have a top mic on the snare and then a bottom mic, they will cancel each other out because they're getting the vibration of the drum at opposite times. So when you have a peak on one file on your top mic, it's actually going the exact opposite on the bottom mic. So you flip the phase so they work together and build that sound up instead of canceling each other out. It's definitely a video worth checking out. Now, here's the thing, if you guys are curious about audio basics and you want to know something, please leave a comment below. If I think somebody can learn something for it, I'll be more than happy to either answer it on the show or maybe even do a dedicated episode. This is the thing, there are no bad questions because we are all new at one point or another and I'm more than happy to pass on what I've learned over the last 25 years or whatever it's been now to you guys coming up who want to know how this shit works. Anyway, please do me a favor, make sure you hit the subscribe button if you haven't. <laughs> Give it a like, maybe share the video, and I'll see you guys back here on Sunday for Oldies But Baddies. Thanks so much for watching. You guys have an amazing weekend. Well, like I said at the beginning of the Americanized version of the Japanese cartoon Science Ninja Teen Gat. You might have seen the, the Americanized cartoon called Science. Uh, yeah, one more time. Ugh. Now I've got a bunch of guest. Now I've got a. Now I've got a bunch of guest judges coming up. Uh, in a, and I just shot a couple episodes with Rudy. Ad <laughs> Probably some kind of a two by four framing with some. Uh, Definitely a video worth checking out, and if you're, it's definitely a, it's definitely a video worth checking out. Now this is the thing I want to, exp and pull the threshold back, and then start opening up. Let me do that one more time.